Buon pomeriggio a tutti, siamo qui alla, in questa bellissima sede del gasometro ospiti di Maker Fair e eh, stiamo per iniziare questo eh, approfondimento sui temi di come la cultura ci può aiutare a vedere il futuro e ad interpretare il futuro attraverso gli strumenti di innovazione. So see how the future can help us uh, predict what is going to happen, but also based on the past. This is the approach and the spirit of Make Fair's friends. Uh, today we will discuss about it with Jeffrey Schnapps, that is the director, the head of Meta Lab of the Harvard University, that we uh, greet. Good morning. And he also, he speaks very good Italian. And he has been pursuing very important designing projects in relation to cultural initiatives in Italy, starting from the city of Trento. And then, after his speech, after the keynote speech by Jeffrey Schnapps, we will speak with Umberto Crotti, that is the director of Feder Culture, and with my colleague, because she also teaches at La Sapienza University, that is the director of the research centre, Saperi Co, that is at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. So without further ado, I give the floor to uh, Mr. Schnapps, and then we will meet again after his speech. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I am sorry for not being there in person in Rome. I have just come back from Italy, uh, so I have a little bit of jet lag. So I hope I will be understandable and uh, coherent. Uh, today's topic that is centered on the word comune makes me um, trace back my journey within the context of this digital revolution that is deeply changing every aspect of our culture, around which there is a debate on the common space, the shared space, which has been at the core of the birth of new formats and new manners uh, uh, to uh, access cult digital culture. I will present a slideshow to uh, accompany my reflection, and I will, will try to speak for only 30 minutes. So I'm about to share my screen. I would like to start uh, from presenting my topic, that is, uh, talking about the shift from the concept of commons to the concept of commoner, citizen or commoner, that is the inhabitant of this space that we decide as common space, that is a common, shared, inclusive space, but also it has its own roles. Every common space has a framework of regulations, uh, government and so on. So my title is Building Creative Commons for Commoners. And uh, most importantly, I would like to react to the setting of this debate by also telling you some uh, concrete episodes, and I will answer to these four questions. Where does that ground come from? I mean, that common ground, where does that ground come from? How is it mapped, interpreted, and disciplined? How has it shifted over the past decades, especially uh, at the time when the concept of commons has become an object of debate in the world of the internet, in the internet community, and in various disciplines that have been at the core of a reflection on the 
of the uh, regulation of this new uh, square, public square of our era. What are some of the plows and the harrows that allow us to cultivate the ground in novel, provocative, playful, and productive ways? So. Uh, this, is, this is a common ground that we can cultivate in a productive way, also in a financial way. And finally, how do we support and sustain forward-looking approaches uh, to cultural practice today? So in this way, not only we will uh, lead to provocation, but also to sustainability long-term sustainability. I think it is a, an essential point, and I would like to focus on that in particular. I am talking to you from Cambridge, and the word common for an Anglo-American person, especially in this region of the US, is a word that has a deep meaning in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. This word is linked to the idea of agriculture, that is the common ground, that are green areas. I am literally 400 meters away from the Cambridge Common that was established in 1630 as a common space surrounded by uh, built areas, also private areas, also the area of the Harvard University that is next to another common ground, another green area. What was the purpose of those green areas, those grounds for the citizens? These were used for agriculture, but based on the agricultural techniques at that time, uh, not only uh, people needed ground to be exploited privately, uh, uh, but also they needed uh, grounds for the cattle, for the cows, for the sheep that could be shared by the different social classes, uh, and including Harvard professors. Uh, I, as a Harvard professor, would have had the right to, uh, to, to, to bring my cows to that common ground and maybe next to a farmer that was a real professional of agriculture. So these are and farming. So these are interesting spaces because they represent an inclusivity where common and private interests mixed. And also where there was the idea of uh, uh, a blood relationship where different social classes uh, could mix and where it was possible to also have fun. And so it was a hybrid space. Um, that uh, proposes a lesson that was also interpreted with at, at the beginning of the World Wide Web as a sort of shared space. And uh, here you can see a diagram of 2000 where you can see a sketch of the utopia of the utopian common shared ground where it was possible to pursue private projects and also where it was possible to uh, have social interactions and also it was a space for debate and it was possible to exchange resources in that space. That is a vision with which I have been growing over time. Then I will uh, tell you about some projects that failed or were successful depending on the point of view. And so they were all uh, inspired by this idea of digital commerce. Uh, ground, uh, 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 and the idea of the digital common ground uh, that could um, go above the borders of social and state institutions' roles that had limited, constrained appearance on new forms of sharing. So this um, is 
related to a platform that is related to this utopian network. Uh, Craigslist was born in my area in San Francisco when I was teaching at the University of Stanford. Craig was a a guy that in 1995 wanted to exchange information on events, on concerts, meetings, uh, performances, uh, and he created a sort of list that he published, and uh, his friends used this bulletin board to uh, add alerts, job alerts, uh, and also sale alerts. Uh, and after four or five years, uh, this phenomenon that was born at the house of this person in San Francisco became a phenomenon that uh, became larger and larger, and it became a, a, a web portal. And uh, today, it is the website that is the 72nd website in the world because it is it is for free. It is very simple. It is very light. It is very easy to translate. Uh, so it allows to exchange any kind of information. The interface is like this even now. So it is the expression of a cultural form that was um, created at the bottom. And it can still uh, teach us a lesson at the moment. And there are other phenomena. Uh, th then we have the open source software to share IT resources uh, to build shareable uh, libraries that could be shared with the community of developers. These are typical phenomena of a moment of the culture of the internet, of these uh, commons uh, uh, that people were trying to create uh, that was a bottom up. Uh, phenomenon. Just think about Wikipedia, uh, that is in line with this initiative to create a new common ground, uh, to share information that to are an, an, an inclusive ground. But soon, people realized how important it was to discipline this space. And so people needed to create roles that could guarantee not only the open access and inclusivity, but also an open access that is based on some organi organizing principles to avoid that that open access could become a, a, a mechanism that could be exploited too easily and manipulated too easily. So that is why some organizations that are always um, at the forefront in defending the, 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 the citizens' uh, interests, such as the Electronic Frontiers uh, Foundation, became the protagonists of this process uh, because they wanted to pursue some of those values uh, that have been supporting the birth of the Internet as a common space. As uh, my, my research started within this context, I founded the Stanford Humanities Lab in 1999. It was a space where we wanted to experiment new forms of practice in the sector of human sciences and arts. But as you can see, uh, there is a list of values and co-creation and collaboration and sharing were at the core of this wish to create a common culture and a common ground. Uh, I will show to you an experiment that is not well known, probably, but it is an example of what we produced at this Stanford Humanities Lab. Not only we pursued a series of projects regarding museums with new forms of education, new hybrid publications that were digital and paper publications. So we created two spin-off startups based on technologies that we had developed. When Mark Zuckerberg speaks about the metaverse, I must say that me and my collaborators, that I, that my collaborators and I scratch our heads a bit because this vision of a space where one could freely share 3D objects and build an interaction, a space that could be 3D was a virtual world 
uh, inside the browser. And it is something that we did. So you can see how it worked. So objects could be exported or imported. Uh, but that was different from Second Life and other virtual spaces of the time. Anyway, it was a space that was completely built around a social sharing platform based on chat boxes, avatar, and so on. There was also the idea of building somehow a piece of that infrastructure of a communication and sharing and community uh, to which and there, ha there have been uh, the more successful attempts of that kind, such as Wikipedia and internet.com. But the internet that then we uh, created was different from that internet on the common ground. Uh, you, you can say these delicious caricatures uh, of uh, these artists, uh, or these artists, he did those in 2007 and in 2010. Now, internet is a world of trolls. It is divided like the states na and the nations. It is not a space of sharing anymore. It is more and more a kingdom of techno tribes that live inside the bubbles uh, and the real uh, web, which appeared as a social and cultural space, has this kind of mapping where actually that surface, that public area uh, that we refer to when we think about the web space is just the tip of the iceberg, literally. It is the tip of the iceberg where the role played by the great protagonists such as Google is fundamental. So imagining that common space, that common ground, in my view, is something that we should keep doing, not only with the dream of going back or going forward toward a model of digital commons as we imagined it in 2000 or 2005. I wish to understand that often uh, the uh, corporate partnership partners are essential for the stability and scalability of, ca of projects and also cultural projects. I will briefly also present another spin-off startup that then leads us to um, in my work here at Harvard in 2011 at the MetaLab, we developed, actually the MetaLab was created to develop another platform, another, pla another software that trying to be in line with the values uh, of the time at the Sanford Humanities Lab. We wanted to overcome one great internet constraint, that is how to work with this marvelous world of images, videos, uh, uh, and sound recordings. Uh, how could we work in a smooth, rapid way without always uh, having to fight against the issue of the copyrights that prevented us from reproducing those content? So Siga, that is an homage to Siga Vert of the great uh, um, Soviet director was a production software, a sort of app that instead allowed to build and merge as a sort of production studio copies of objects into a multimedia product or communication. And it was based on the user link. It was a sort of live assembly project where each object or mean or communication that was accessible through an application program could be put into a sequence of images uh, of a form of communication that we called SIGAS. So it was possible to produce a SIGA. And this process of assembly and curation and editing ended up with the SIGA project according to this sequence that you can see here. So this platform uh, attracted the interest of some venture capitalists, and then SIGA led to uh, the creation of two divisions. One division went to San Francisco, 
Uh, so it left Boston and it went to San Francisco and it went inside an incubator and the product was developed, it became an app and then it was purchased eventually by BuzzFeed. I will now make another example of a cultural product that stemmed from Sega. This was a co-created Sega uh, as a sort of video edition of the most important experimental poem by Malarmé for the Arts Museum of San Francisco. I would like to stress that you are saying gifts that Clearly, clearly, this is a screen capture. Those gifts were on service all over the world, but they were assembled live with some uh, lacking uh, and aspects that could not be foreseen. And uh, so when they, they were created at the moment, at the time when the user clicked uh, on something and could follow the sequence of the Sega, we are talking about a sort of new means of communication. It was very volatile where somebody could take could take away an object from Flickr or a site web or a website uh, also based on the concept of commons. But the interesting thing is that it was possible to work freely without any constraints in a creative, a communicative uh, manner, in a journalistic manner, with that wealth of materials that are literally available at any time in this uh, common space that is the internet, but without having to face the obstacle of copyright because uh, one needed, did not need to download anything. Uh, a certain object was only accessed for a certain uh, moment during which uh, those things could be read or watched. So as we've seen in the last year, in particular, there has been the appearance of a series of new forms of experimentation with images, with uh, image data banks related to the spread of the AI. There are many platforms that generate texts or soundtracks or work with other elements. Um, for example, if you ask Dali to interpret uh, the future culture is coming, we, you can see it is a very poor tool. It is a poor that we have to perfect uh, over time. But it is interesting. I think that now we have some creativity forms that are augmented and extended somehow. And so it offers an opportunity which has also caused a conflict in the community of creators. Jason, Jason Allen, as it was said by the newspapers, won an art uh, competition. Uh, by using Midjourney, and he was accused of having uh, generated a fake, even though the category that won was the category of digital artworks. So there is a difference. What is the difference between Photoshop and the Journey? And Midjourney, these are two different tools that have different degrees of agency by the artist. These are forms of augmented creativity. And these forms now also include animation and a series of forms of expression. All of this is very interesting, but there is a problem behind that. Are they part of the commons or not? The answer is complex because the databases uh, of images uh, uh, have issues uh, uh, and various uh, content creators are taking away some images uh, that are the training data of these AI systems uh, uh, that then become creation platforms, platforms that allow to create new objects. So once again, behind the appearance of these new forms of creativity, there is an issue that we have to tackle. How can we tackle it? That is our question.
In my view, we reached this mature phase of commons uh, that we are trying to open for creativity, and that is transparency, the uh, basic importance of showing and curating those data that then train these uh, very powerful tools that is the artificial intelligence. Uh, so I will now very briefly mention a project developed by some of my colleagues uh, that not only tackles uh, the cultural issues related to those uh, data banks uh, and the fact that they're invisible to those, uh, even to those uh, who use those tools, but they also have social consequences when those platforms uh, and tools are used in politics uh, and in the civic world very often when uh, training data banks are limited or reflect some biases uh, of the contemporary society, uh, they simply repeat and exaggerate and expand the impact of those biases. Um, so how can we create a commons where one can understand what lies behind a platform and what are the data with which a certain tool has been uh, nurtured and fed uh, in order to generate better content? The solution is very simple. It is a solution that generates a mechanism that clarifies um, all the phases and steps of the creation of a tool of this kind. So, somehow, we need to anticipate and share with the user this. Uh, just like the food label, we need to share the ingredients, basically, that feed an AI platform so in that way, then the user can be a critical user, and that is more effective um, as a creator. And so the user understands what is uh, hidden behind um, the surface. Uh, uh, so he understands what are the choices and strategies that led to the creation of a certain object. Now we are going through a phase in which this project led to the creation of a series of labels based on the nutrition fact label. And thanks to the collaboration with IBM, Google, and so on, this uh, is becoming a new standard. So those who work with an AI tool will be able to uh, have uh, a critical and creative understanding of what lies behind without simply using a certain tool in a blind and naive manner. So this project was awarded the Ars Electronica 2022, so I think it was worth mentioning it. I will be very brief, uh, as I am about to conclude. I would like to speak about uh, culture strict to sense now. In the case of museums, uh, you know, I recently participated uh, in an exhibition that ended two months ago. This exhibition made an experiment by using these uh, machine learning techniques and also AI techniques in order to create new types of experiences, new uh, scales of experiences with the artistic collection of a museum, in this case, the Art Museum of Harvard, that is just behind the corner. So we tried to use an AI tool to carry out analysis of more than 10,000 objects belonging to five or six categories of art forms from ceramics to coins to paintings. So we used an AI tool to extract information on the gaze of a human subject that then was retreated, reprocessed. It was a very complex uh, process, but the same face recognition technology was used here not to identify people, but to tell the story and the types of evolution of ideas uh, on the human gaze that, of course, is at the core of the artistic experience. It is a very 
complex initiative because, of course, we might move from sculpture to paintings and other forms of art. And clearly, uh, the conventions or representations change very much. So AI tools now are facing a very complex task. So we had to train repeatedly our AI tool to reach a relatively precise representation of those phenomena and then create a mapping that allows us to see the distribution of cases in a collection of 10,000 objects uh, split into different categories. There are photographies and photographs and also um, paintings and others. Uh, so you can see that uh, people that look in the camera in the kind uh, looking in the camera in the case of photography in the case of photography is uh, predominant, is prevailing. So to conclude, how can we use cultural collections uh, within a scientific or artistic project of this kind. We can do that only thanks to a certain infrastructure. We need a very good API that is very well done with an architecture that was designed to help the creative or scientific community working with this kind of material in a rigorous, a precise manner with photographs that are checked based on the color on the scale. And this type of, infra of infrastructure exists in only a few museums in the world. That is a problem. The British Museum has a very good API, but in Italy we do not have one single museum that has an API that the researchers or creatives, or creative people can work freely for their collections and work. So to conclude, uh, because I do not want to be late, I will state once again that the common ground always starts locally, as it was in the case of the Cambridge Common that was a shared space, also a hybrid place. And this has not changed in the last decades with the digital revolution, but it has become global. It has become a local world that is hyper-connected to the rest of the world. And so clearly, we need to invent new manners to participate and to share between the local website and the world to which it is linked. What are the tools that we can develop around this common space? Clearly, we have the world of the open source softwares, which still exists and is still relevant. But there are also tools that are part of the private software world. There are some uh, uh, AI generative platforms, uh, AI libraries. Uh, and in addition to that, there are the institutions that have a cultural mission, but that need to be reinterpreted for our time. There are museums, libraries, archives, but also social media platforms, and so on. And then one last point. How can we support and uh, scale those approaches? Um, clearly, openness, transparency, and quality values are sacred, but they are not enough. Uh, as we have seen over time, we should also uh, focus on how to regulate, to discipline those spaces. How can we build partnerships between the public and the private sector? But most importantly, we should focus on building infrastructures, uh, which is a dimension that we tend to neglect because sometimes we are too passionate for innovation. Thank you very much. Allora, grazie mille per questa... Thank you very much for this extremely interesting speech. I would like to get back on, on one of the last points you highlighted. You mentioned an infrastructure as an element for development. 
a new element that can attract new creators, creative people, and starting from this encounter, new interactions may arise. I'm an expert in development, and um, I think that this is not enough. Infrastructures are not enough. There's a need for a strong governance of the system. The approach should be um, an approach based on capabilities. The community and the subjects are sharing the space, a real space that starts from the local level and that spans to other levels. So is it an element uh, that is capable of using this element uh, uh, with uh, a fair approach that is based on uh, sharing? I think this is a great opportunity. And in fact, instead of scaling up the audience and institutions uh, have, uh, the institutions have to face this challenge and the new idea of museum has been based on inclusion of people who are not uh, members of uh, this common. So Who's going to help people who are not members of a museum, so to say, who are not users of museums to be able to use a museum? There's also a double uh, reality, the local reality that is linked to history and traditions. It is something that the Anglo-Saxon world uh, uh, is uh, experiencing at the level of the university. When you are linked to a physical place, you um, should also look at the future. So in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, they start from their local and traditional area and they look at the future. Here things are quite different. So. We are born in Rome, we are very um, tied to the city of Rome. We can look at the past, but it becomes quite challenging for us to look at the future. However, we should um, identify the opportunities the future um, presents. Sabrina Lucimbelli and Umberto Groppi perhaps may give us a uh, different insight, uh, starting from a more real and concrete reality, the local one, that may uh, be used uh, as an inspiration. Hello, Sabrina. Sabrina Lucibello is a professor of industrial design. Jeffrey Snap repeated several times, it is a matter of drawing not only uh, products and objects, but also designing projects with the logic of co-designing, that is to say, in the logic of cooperation, starting by a dimension of the city, a specific dimension of the city. And this is uh, the main topic of it, of how these elements may help uh, an urban context, a city, to be included and to experience in a more effective way cultural and social environments like other, with other cities, and not to be excluded by a world that is running fast. On the other side, this is done also by uh, public and uh, private uh, subjects at the local level. Companies are doing it as well, and uh, Roberto is here on behalf, uh, representing uh, cultural enterprises, and I would like to underline the word enterprises. 
An enterprise is an organized world that uh, produces um, services or goods. It is within the interaction between companies and the institutions that uh, we may find something called common. The common here is the market. Without a market, there is no interaction among these entities, so no value is created. So now I'm going to, link, to leave the floor to Sabrina Lucibello. She's going to tell us about her uh, opinion about the, the insights that uh, Jeffrey has just presented. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, thanks to everybody. Well, first of all, I would like to say something. Well, uh, we are talking about innovation, how we innovate our cities and uh, things. It may be a virtual innovation, but it, we should not lose touch with the reality. We cannot uh, work without sustainable innovation. Jeffrey has explained it quite well. So we should move from the product to the system, that is to say to the world. We do not need to own things. We need to um, get into a system where things are shared in, in an open source way. We, could, we can see the, the all productive uh, chain So uh, the supply chain, chain uh, spans from production to recycling of the, of the same product. We should not only consider these two phases, but all the implications of the use of the products, being them material or immaterial implications. The final result of this huge work is sustainable innovation. According to a traditional process, it was designed in order to um, respond to the needs of uh, individuals in order to make their life easier. According to the green approach, production is a systemic approach that aims at uh, solving the problems of human beings and at the same time, the problems of the planet. I'm in Florence for a very interesting conference of the Italian design schools that are um, uh, reflecting about, upon these topics. How we can um, transform the citizens of the future into new um, designers I'm sure Umberto Crocchi will get uh, deeply into it, but when we speak about sustainability, it is not only a, ma a matter of uh, marketability and communication, it is also a matter of uh, economy, because we're talking about companies that have uh, uh, found profitable to speak about uh, the environment. So you should not only be competitive, you should also be green. So, innovation needs sustainability. It is not the other way around. The exchange of goods and services allow us to, allows us to live in the smart cities. At La Sapienza, uh, I am director of uh, Saperi & Co., which is a uh, physical space in which people can meet in order to share not only uh, things and goods, but also facilities and tools, cultural tools and also material tools. This is how um, well, small productive, I mean, in our houses there could be small productive centers in order to organize the public spaces that are inside the cities in order to work better 
add culture. So spaces that are uh, thought for productivity should be used for by everybody. Spaces and productivity are, are also shared, shared on demand. And this uh, changes the whole situation. I'd also like to tell that Italy could have a prominent role, and I'm saying so because we apologize, but there's a technical problem. Well, Jeffrey underlined the importance of infrastructures, and we've just uh, seen how important they are. Sorry, I went offline for a couple of seconds. Well, I was uh, just telling that Italy is uh, a country based on uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, we have more than 100 cities. Our history uh, is extremely long. And uh, the label made in Italy uh, is uh, uh, still alive because of cooperatives, because of the districts, because of groups of people that have made the history of our country. So this was what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. We're now going to leave the floor to Umberto Croppi. Umberto Croppi is going to give us his opinion about these topics. First of all, I would like to thank you for your invitation. Hello, Sabrina. Hello, Jeffrey. We've been working together for a long time. I'd like to, well, please stop me if I'm, if I'm going to speak too long. I, I haven't planned my uh, speech for today, and I'm happy because what has been told by the previous speakers is so interesting that I would like to uh, link my observations to what they said. Sometimes I have this uh, tendency to um, think that certain things are trivial, but I usually make a mistake when I think about it. People around me usually uh, lead me to think about uh, redesigning uh, the, my professional pathway. Here we have Alessandro Ferrante, and together with him in 1995, we organized the first conference about uh, the web in 1995 and with Sabrina and Jeff at the Foundation Valori Italia 10 years after all we organized a um, conference about what today is called metaverso one part of the literature was already considered as metaverso we analyzed it uh, through a series of workshops before the internet in Italy, Stefano Rodotà uh, created a movement called uh, ITC Democracy, Democrazia per l'Informatica. We should get back to those texts. They uh, used uh, uh, Telemachus, so they uh, imaged, uh, they, they thought about an age in which uh, uh, there was no internet, and Telemachus was considered as the uh, as the high tech man of the time. So within this process and within these um, thoughts, give me a clear idea of what I was about what I was about to tell. We have a structure and an, and an overstructure. We tend to com to um, confuse the uh, overstructure with the structure. I think that companies are members of the overstructure. Tools and networks are 
and overstructure. Structural problems are those that have been listed by Jeffrey. And according to the experts, are they constitute the main challenges. And I'm going to deal with one of them. It is a key one. Please don't tell anybody what I'm going to tell you because I'm going to be removed from all uh, my um, appoint from all my appointments. Well, at the beginning, there was a man who invented the axe. The gli alberi e ad uccidere gli animali con più facilità. So. So the man with the axe didn't uh, issue a patent for it. He actually went to his friends to share that discovery because if you had an axe, you had in a powerful position, but people who were um, next to them saw that they had an axe and they created one as well. They couldn't be reported for misappropriation because there was no, no such thing as uh, um, a patent. They were pushed by the possibility to uh, replicate that invention, and there was no way to protect that uh, idea. So competition arised because the neighboring uh, a uh, group could defend themselves or attack the other group. Such a high level of competition led to the creation of um, tools that are more and more effective. So if uh, utility and impossibility had not existed, progress wouldn't have existed. We're now going to move on to something uh, uh, that we know more. When Homer um, wrote his works, uh, um, uh, what was he uh, pushed by? What did he write uh, his work? Um, he did it because he wanted to share his works with uh, the community. And uh, the same could be applied to the whole uh, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and Asian art. There were, um, there were, uh, there were um, uh, duplication uh, forms of art. When did it all change? Well, it all changed when a new possibility uh, was generated, and it was uh, uh, printing. That is to say, when something you think about, it also changed thanks to the industry and everything that Marx Weber taught us about. So the possibility to replicate something at an industrial level and uh, the spreading of them throughout uh, paper, throughout electronic supports. Then somebody came, and this somebody said, uh, this is, uh, I mean, the source of it is my work. So the system of protection uh, was born throughout cultural and legal tools. Nowadays, the revolution is similar in scope. So we're back to the X. And that's because utility could be reached by anybody. And there's also an impossibility to limit such use. So the use changes radically. I'm saying this because we are a small group of people, so please don't mention it outside here. What happened in music? 
the disappearance of physical supports has made the um, music industry uh, disappear. However, all of a sudden, music industry had to accept that uh, free uh, music sharing is the key to make money. Up until a few years ago, concerts were organized in order to promote uh, new uh, discs. Today, it's not like that. It is music that is used to promote concerts. And nowadays, the real business is concerts. We all have the possibility to write a book and to publish it without uh, the mediation of a third subject, uh, earning uh, sums of money that are not possible uh, throughout uh, the traditional methods of the publishers. Therefore, we should um, take stock of this true revolution. It is not only one of the elements I wanted to highlight. However, it is uh, an important one. Uh, Mr. Snap is nodding his head, so I hope that he uh, shares my view. It entails a shift in the, in the language so the old uh, cinema and video industry is based on uh, uh, new languages, if we compare them to 10 years ago. I cannot tell you whether they are uh, worse or better, but if you watch um, a TV show, you know that that is designed, that is created in order to be uh, seen uh, uh, the, the, on a smartphone. So the whole industry of special effects and so on doesn't exist any longer. The main elements of the TV show now are the plot and the rhythm. They uh, may lower the level, but they enlarge the number of users of that product. So inclusion, community, the community is a structure. New generations, uh, I mean, um, we shouldn't talk about these topics. Uh, it's young people who should, because we were born before uh, these, uh, uh, the technological revolution. Our children are an integral part of this world. I know that the risks are huge, so you may just need an element of crisis the so-called uh, solar storm that uh, uh, cut off uh, uh, energy supply for 12 hours uh, and everything uh, um, that makes us uh, uh, social animals uh, will be off. However, we have to take stock of it. The overstructure and the institutions are stammering all the time, are struggling all the time. As trade unionists, we um, uh, fight in order to obtain more uh, funding for um, uh, the digital transformation. We always claim for uh, more advanced products. And I'm just going to give you uh, an example. Well, if we, if the same museum will keep having a director who's an artistic or scientific doc, uh, director, quite rarely a commercial director, and almost never a manager, if we keep like that, Who's responsible for the um, ITC? Quite often, they are members of the staff. So we should that should provide these tools so to as a scientific doctor, who, uh, director, who uh, most of the times doesn't understand the thing about ITC because they are knowledgeable about other things. And it is that director who decides 
what to do. So until uh, the uh, direction of a, of a museum is given to an economist, to, to uh, an ITC expert, uh, nothing will change. However, in order to change it, the mindset should change. I've known all companies uh, that work in Italy, and uh, I can tell you that uh, as more um, as more um, directing class uh, has been, a more a, a new class of leaders has developed, but when it comes to the private and the public se sector, you have to look at. Um, at the balance and at the budget. And even here, I would uh, refer myself to something that happened not long ago. We've said quite often that uh, the pandemic forced uh, our cultural uh, institutions to um, use um, technological tools uh, we didn't use before. I'm a member of the Quadriellare di Roma, so I'm not saying that I'm not um, liable for it. So, in the best case scenario, and if we use a bad word, we can, we can use the word metaverso. I cannot use the um, distinction real and virtual. When I speak about culture, I look at the dictionary and virtual means something different. This is another form of reality. So sh sharing online the possibility, well, giving uh, the possibility to visit a place online with uh, all the information required. And I think a SNAP may remember it, but we said that, a f but that by assessing the first developments of Second Life, uh, it transforms into an interactive storage. And in fact, now you can look at the Quadriennale whenever you want, the exact same way was uh, realized. However, this is just a duplication of what's been done. Jeffrey, at the end of his intervention, showed us artificial intelligence linked to uh, different possibilities, such as a possibility to measure the uh, visitor's attention. So this is one of the examples on which we should innovate and update our system. Like the others, I've spoken about museums and companies. We could speak about it forever, as well as of all the other sectors. So we could speak about the culture, that it's not only uh, the use of cultural goods, but it's also based on social uh, relations. The first form of culture was the state of that money who put together a stone with a stick of wood uh, make an axe and explain other people how to make an axe. Thank you very much. You know that Jeffrey Schnapps has to leave. Maybe would you like to comment on what you've heard? Or maybe not? No. I would just like to thank uh, my colleagues for these very interesting reflections and I am more and more convinced that despite the many problems that we have to face in Italy in this industry, as Sabrina said, there are some aspects in Italy that are promising if we coordinate the stakeholders effectively uh, and if we manage to engage them in projects, bottom-up projects that help us 
what can help us model this new kind of culture. So I believe that we can do good things. I'm always optimistic also as an American uh, who has been focusing on studying the Italian culture in particular. I must say that Italy is still a superpower in this uh, domain, but we need to understand how to act with the superpower. And then, as Roberto said very well, but I would say it even more directly, one of the consequences of the digital revolution that is uh, always there and prevailing is the growing importance of processes instead of products. So when we think about culture and that defensive model of management or stewardship of objects uh, that is sacred, is fundamental, clearly conservation of objects for future is essential. But uh, but sadly, at times, it has distracted us from the processes of design and values. And so the digital solutions um, open uh, gates uh, uh, to creative worlds, just like uh, in the music, as Roberto said. We can allow artists to work with the heritage and not treating the heritage as a sort of reservation area that we show only from time to time to uh, or for example, there are researchers that are geeks that want to work with the data bank. So these are essential resources. Uh, for this common ground that we are trying to build. So I am sorry, but I have to teach uh, at my seminar in a troubling manner. I will start today's lesson with a culture, with, with a digital visit to the Vittoriale degli Italiani. Since we are starting Gabriele D'Annunzio, and we are reading it. And so this is just a small testimony of the added value of the digital solutions that can help us build 3D, 2D uh, storytelling, uh, because this kind of visit would not have been possible in person with my PhD students. And so thank you very much, and I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for leaving you now. I hope that the rest of your meeting would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, good work. And now, to conclude, I would like to build on what's been said by Sabrina and Umberto. I would like to start by something very concrete. Uh, we, as a country in the digital world, we've been, you know, we've been. Uh, for, we've been investing resources, allocating resources for digitalization of the industrial heritage. So this means that there is the uh, centralized infrastructure that has to be developed by the great technological players and the and we will then have a huge digital library. Libraries are built so that people can go there to study and read, and so can form, and so people can form ideas that then are going to generate thoughts and feelings. And so the interaction with the digital eliminates some physical problems related to the, con to the conservation and paves new ways. But it does not solve the issue of uh, the related to the creative part, that is the part of art historians, curators, and so on. So how can these people use this heritage to create pathways and opportunities that can uh, generate feelings and that attaching? Uh, because if we do not manage to do so, things will not reproduce because they will be cold things. Secondly, we do not 
uh, widen our audience. Um, so we will not be able to reach some sectors and people that do not have the capabilities and the minimum tools. Jeffrey Schnapp did not use the word toolbox, but it is a, a, a word that is very much used by the Americans. So these people do not have the right toolbox to participate and interact with this great challenge and great opportunity whether they are companies, meaning subjects that produce value, also cultural value, that clearly is linked to financial value. On the other hand, we cannot develop such things based on the idea of those that build this basic infrastructure and the relationship between the great basic infrastructure and the single participants in the market has to be disciplined well. I say that the subjects need to be helped to participate, meaning that they should be provided with the minimum toolbox, at least uh, those who have uh, higher skills should be able to, to participate and contribute. Be also because the digital revolution allows us to overcome the physical obstacles of our national market. And so we can generate those uh, feelings uh, also outside the too low language and of the new platforms. Uh, at times even overcome the problem of the language from a technical point of view anyway that is the uh, less uh, uh, lesser obstacle. So the digital is a great opportunity. I think that the same reflection applies uh, to all those actions where digital digitalization should uh, produce benefits for the citizens uh, in their relationship with health care and basic institutions uh, and any other subject. And that is also a great challenge. It is a great cultural challenge and not a simply technological challenge. So early in that matter, we can spread innovation because if there are subjects that filter the elements that are going to be spread, because also there are constraints related to the size, because those who manage the platforms and also the production of contents have to have that kind of attitude. Also, in the sh also the sharing economy is based on the idea according to which we use things and we do not own things. So we are more focused on the immediate use and not on the possession. So this on, on ownership. Also, this world is managed by huge players because some good ideas uh, were then always acquired by huge operators um, and so there is a, a, a limit uh, at the entry uh, so it is related to the issue of governance uh, then we need a subject that disciplines uh, these uh, interactions uh, between small stakeholders and the large infrastructure. Clear institutions uh, have not developed such rules very much, so that is another problem. So to conclude, I will ask Sabrina and Umberto to sum up these concepts in two minutes. Uh, Sabrina, you have the floor. Thank you. I will actually say something more. I am a material woman because I work with objects. Jeffrey spoke about the digital world and Jeffrey spoke about the prehistoric world and the world of future. I hope that we will manage to strike a balance because we should uh, reach the digital that is mixing physical things with the uh, digital reality in order to uh, find a new perspective that is based on sharing. That is not only the digital world. When Second Life appeared, I was terrified because that was a huge reality that escaped me. 
So I hope that we can all find, that we can all strike a balance, a mix between the digital world and the material world and our daily life, the products and services as we remember them and for which Italy is a master. I will speak for only one minute because I spoke for too long earlier. I would just like to say that in the light of all the things that have been said and you stressed some important aspects, I am optimistic. I am becoming a pessimist in general, but I am optimistic in this realm because the delays in the uh, infrastructure of the institutions are then overcome by the structure, by us, by those who work, by the young people, by the makers uh, that do things, that know things, and so they become stronger, and the overstructure has will have to follow them, to follow us. That is true, and I believe that we can be very optimistic and uh, uh, retrieve some uh, physical, artisanal um, values, because if we focus on the processes and not only on the products, uh, things become old, but processes do not become old. So this is a great opportunity. Processes to need roles because, of course, normally processes are disciplined and not only products are disciplined. So these processes have to be developed within certain limits in relation to efficiency, transparency, accessibility to avoid that somebody abuses um, its own power. So conclude with a joke. Somebody said that banks are the judges that could decide whether somebody could live or die in the capitalist world, because banks can decide whether an entrepreneur, whether an entrepreneur's idea should be financed or not. So the world has a lively structure where financing sources uh, widespread, and that actually protects us from these uh, kinds of bottlenecks characterized by somebody that can decide whether some processes can develop in a certain direction or in another direction. So the digital uh, provides a material uh, additional opportunity. I think that that is very clear, and we need to focus very much on the traditional element that is the past, the heritage, the, the built heritage, not only materially built, but also in thinking about the materials and also the, in, the, the aspects that are not material. And on the other hand, we can go through the Hercules pillars and reach markets that were unimaginable. Thank you very much. We have now reached the end of our session, and we've been, we are very much on time, like the Swiss. And let us now uh, give the floor to the next workshop. Buongiorno a tutti, spero di essere in linea. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Bene, allora, ehm, attendo un cenno da parte vostra sul, 
su quando cominciare, io sono Luca Melchionna, buongiorno a tutti, mi scusi. I am Luca Melchionna. Sorry for not being here in person. But I will moderate the panel remotely. Direi cominciamo appena, appena vedrò le persone sul palco. We start as soon as I see the people on the stage. Benissimo, buongiorno. Allora, um, Good morning, very well. I see that our guests are reaching the stage. We are here to talk about innovation, in particular innovative mindset among those who manage the cultural heritage. That is today's topic. It is a world that, I, that is very dear to me. Um, and I focus on financial planning, but also creative industry are at the core of uh, systems that allow to develop knowledge. And creative industries produce measurable values, products and processes, and also social values, such as cohesion, memory, it allows us to avoid reinventing the wheel every 10 years. Our guests operate in very different contexts, but they share something. They are going to tell us how to develop effective strategies uh, within systems based on the exchange of knowledges uh, and they will tell us how to reconcile financial and social developments. Uh, it is also fun because fun is an essential part of social developments. So this discussion is relevant because we face some challenges as a community, as the community of cultural operators that look after the conservation of the heritage, also with the climate change and the effort to stay relevant. In the cultural consumption world, clearly there is the competition of other formats that do not enhance the cultural heritage. So we need to understand what to do with this kind of challenge among the most urgent challenges, there is the issue of leadership. So who is going to make the decisions and also uh, we should learn to manage the risks. So who is going to face the growing costs of management due to uh, phenomena that have been worsened by the war that is not an abstract war, but it is an, imper an imperialistic war. I will just make one small theor theoric contribution. I think that in order to, to I think that in I think that innovating the Italian cultural heritage is different from innovating for example Dutch crypto value cryptocurrency so of course we shouldn't we shouldn't simply uh, race towards the future blindly especially in a country like Italy that is always very cautious. Technological innovators instead should teach us something and we should uh, provide us with the formats that we need, such as prototyping. That is the idea according to which in order to publish a product or a service, we do not wait for things to be perfect, but resources are spent to do something concrete 
uh, and to pay the people that uh, make things concretely. So I will introduce you, Mr. Angelo Argento, to you, who is going to leave soon. He's a lawyer uh, that works in different fields. Uh, also, he works for the port. He created the portal Cultura Italia. Argento works on the power of relationships as a leverage for cultural development. And I will ask him some questions in relation to that. First of all, how can you define innovation in a nutshell? How can an innovative mindset be developed and preserved? I hope that you are going to ask this in the specific world of culture. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and for letting me participate in this important event. I followed uh, the previous, I heard the previous panel and Jeffrey spoke about the relationship between the common good and the uh, common ground, common goods and common ground. Let us start from a notion. I am a lawyer, and so culture and cultural good and cultural common ground is OK. But we do not have common goods. That is a juridical, uh, stupid definition. That thought that common goods could philosophically overcome the concept uh, that opposed private goods and public goods. Uh, but that is a category that was not overcome and that cannot be overcome. Jeffrey spoke about the commons at his university, uh, that is uh, a juridical institution that also exists in Italy uh, since, the thousand, since uh, 1000. It defined a common ground that could be used by everybody for cattle and agriculture. What does this mean? We always have to remember that in law, but also in the normal life, there is always one substance, one form, and there is one responsibility that is related to one action. If I am the owner of a good or the holder of a good, uh, I and we have invented this kind of notion in Rome. There are no things that do not belong to anybody, not because they cannot exist, but because there is the notion of responsibility. And even the issue of the, of the management of culture, uh, we find the, a similar uh, constraint. Clearly, culture is like air, and it is necessary for life, and that is, and I think it is necessary, but it cannot be uh, linked to the void or responsibility. Even air, when it is trapped to then generate oxygen and say somebody it is sold, it is, um, and so it is owned by somebody. Uh, so this is fundamental. And I, I thought I should say it also to answer to your question uh, based on what's been said before. So the challenge of innovation in culture is based on that. When we speak about innovation in culture, we think about a series of topics that first of all lead to the use of uh, culture digitally. Is this innovation uh, simply formally using new technological tools uh, in order to access something that has always been there, like care? Or is innovation linked to culture also in the change of, in the transformation of culture? So in 2022, I think it is more relevant to ask ourselves what culture is today, because the notion of culture can be different than f from what it was 50 years ago only, thanks to technology and thanks to its use. So we have to agree, to find an agreement on the word culture. Clearly, it has its own roots in cultivating something, whether it is a passion, an activity, an art, or something else. But today, the notion of a culture uh, has become a very wide notion because culture is the device that reaches mass and also the innovative use of water. 
and so probably we've mixed the area of content and substance and the container and form. So if we really want to talk about innovation of anything, and in particular in culture, we need to understand what culture is for us. For me, it is simply what, it, what it's always been, the aspiration of the human being to transcend himself or herself through the use of his or her own senses. Then there is the extension of senses, whether it is digital or a machine or a brush or a pastel or nothing. A void, like a poem, air, a poem, air, that is still the notion of a culture that can be innovated in its substance, but more, much, even more in its use. And so the challenge of innovation is related to that. How? With the extension of means, everybody should access Traviata. And that happened when we were, uh, when we could not attend concerts uh, live. I think that on the 7th of December, uh, La Scala, uh, pri La Prima della Scala, has been followed by the highest number of viewers on the TV. So that. Um, kind of deprivation turned itself into an opportunity. And through uh, the use of technology, people reached a high culture, and those people could enjoy that. Uh, I think that that is innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. Argento. Also because I know that you are in a hurry because you need to leave. The, the philosophical part is unexpected here in this debate, and it is surely interesting. I would like to remark that surely there have been relevant moments in our national history when the cultural innovation meant that we should not transcend, but actually uh, manipulate what we had. Uh, and just thinking about Venice, for example, whose culture was particularly uh, concentrated on the management of things that were immediate and not on the planning. But probably this should be uh, discussed another time. So very briefly, I will introduce to you the other guests. But in this case, I would like to uh, introduce you one after the other, if you all agree, so that we bear in mind who is uh, talking to us and also it will be clearer for the audience. So if Mr. Argento has to leave, he can leave now, so thank you very much. Goodbye. Sadly, I have to go. I arrived at 3 in order to uh, leave earlier. I am sorry for leaving. Goodbye. Thank you very much for your contribution. So the other people that are with uh, here, that are with us today are partly in person here, partly uh, uh, with us remotely. Uh, now we'll introduce you a person that has been working with over 100 organizations. Uh, in this case, um, there is something relevant about her. Uh, this person says that says our passion is improving everybody's life. When I read this sentence, I was struck because it is a very inspiring, simple sentence. Marcia is specialized in service design. She focuses on the idea, on the idea of the central role of users and also of, of cultural operators. She's also a professor at various universities, and she researches service design also at the business school. And so her contribution will be academic too. Michael Geithner, that is wearing this very bright T-shirt. It develops any kind of gains for the cultural sector, especially for museums. I really wanted him to participate in this debate because Mikhail works for a museum in particular, and he has highlighted some aspects of the former. Soviet Germany. In a genius manner, he was awarded 
an award recently uh, that for, for a simulated chat for teens that makes them reflect on the dangers of political radicalization online. If you want to, you can talk about it later, Mikhail. And then we have Luisa Grasso that is here online, and I hope you can see her. Uh, even though she has an English name, she has a different profile uh, from the others. She founded a manager's an agency, and so she's a creative consultant, and she's specialized in the creation of relationships inside creative industry. She works with museums and artists, but also with NGOs. Luisa Grasso uh, has a high quality professional experience and also innovation is not only technology is also raising the quality of processes and of the uh, sale channels and i think the Italy particularly needs these things. So finally, we have Florinda Sarajeva that is here on the stage in order to speak about a Sicilian cultural center that is very active uh, on uh, social innovation. The mission is we're thinking uh, cities and villages that have less and less inhabitants. Also, they produced an, uh, a contemporary art biennial festival. She was awarded various prizes, uh, and Ms. Ayeva works on long-term projects, very long-term projects. And so her experience is relevant also for those who work for the conservation of the heritage and maybe is fed up by the innovation storytelling that is short-term, well, actually, we can do long-term innovation based on the great ideals. So I always start with the question that I also asked previously to Mr. Argento. It is a very general question. You might not agree with what Angelo said, or you might have something to add or something specific to say that is related to your experience. So anybody can now take the floor. Otherwise, I will invite you to take the floor. So how can we develop an innovative mindset? How can we protect that kind of mindset? How can we protect the people? that show uh, to have that kind of mindset and maybe cannot really use it. Marzia, would you like to start? Salve a tutti. Um, Buongiorno, Marzia. Good afternoon, everybody. Innovative mindset. Well, over the past 15 years, I've worked with the small and medium enterprises as well as with uh, non-profit organizations. And in my experience, there are three main points in order to bring an innovative mindset within the institutions. And I do not think that the cultural uh, sector make any um, exception. Fifth point is investing on people. Quite often, we forget about it. We forget about the so-called frontline staff, that is to say people working at the service delivery, people that have the primary relationship with the public. These are the people who know what the audience needs. So um, companies should invest on them, invest in uh, trainings in order to uh, provide them with the basic methods uh, with the aim of uh, uh, starting with a small ideas and implementing so something useful. My definition of innovation is the practical implementation of an improved or new product service, organizational process or business model. Lab uh, the world implementation is key. Ideas are key, and they are for free. However, the capability to uh, make the most of an idea is uh, what's it's the most difficult step. So first of all, we have to work with people. Uh, we have to provide them with the right skills in order for them to innovate. 
I do not believe in innovation teams that are hired in order to uh, innovate big companies. I believe that innovation should uh, be generated by people working in the company with the, the support of innovation expert of co experts, of course. Then we have uh, another key point, which is the proof project, that is to say, showing in real life what working in a certain way is. So if we talk about the design thinking method methodology, it is not only a matter of training, it is also about analyzing a problem within an institution and applying that tool or that m methodology in order to fix a problem until you have a physical thing, something you can actually assess or measure, this method shows what working in that suggested way means and how beneficial it is. If people see the um, actual effects of a new method, they start to think about them, uh, about the things they've seen. <coughs> The third key element I would like to highlight here is about organizational infrastructures. You've spoken about a lot about infrastructures before. There must not be a technological infrastructures as such. There must be cultural infrastructures. If you have a senior sponsorship within an institute that gives an agency to people making a work, a work in order to change, in order to change the service they provide. Well, it is the uh, cultural institution and the change they provide that should happen at the level of the institution. So there's a need for clarity about the objectives we want to achieve in terms of outcomes and not of output. Quite often, we focus too much on output, on the number of clicks. Well, what matters the most if changing is changing. So we're here for this mission. Our mission is changing. What kind of outcome would you like to uh, produce? So this kind of mindset is key. And these three uh, elements must happen at the same time. I have a lot of clients uh, coming to me and saying, oh, we have to give a training to everybody. And uh, OK, we can do it. But it costs a lot of money. And it's not effective because we have to design ideas that are uh, final. Um, they must be effective. They must be eff effective ideas. They must be tailored. Well, since you've touched upon um, an element, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned the proof project. And I'd like to add that explaining and trying the model of an innovative process could be extremely useful. Because, for example, in Italy, we're quite slow, but uh, we are always willing to learn. I've seen that there, has been, there have been excellent results in museums when they have tried to reuse a rational format, such as the artist's residence. After the proof project was designed, so what's the meaning of having an artist at the museum and perhaps um, uh, nagging you all, all the time? Well, um, it is, of course, stimulating. So my question is, since you've mentioned it before, Are museums, uh, libraries, and archives uh, to be managed by uh, managers or by uh, experts of the sector? By none of them. I agree with what's been said before. Uh, museums, uh, uh, libraries, and archives should be managed by a group of uh, different professionals. Uh, it's like companies, you have the CEO that brings in the voice of the investors, 
then the, you have the representative of human resources. Then you have uh, uh, the financial expert and the organizational expert. We also have the chief design officer, CDO. These are key elements uh, when creating a vision for the future for any type of institution. So you should create a team and design a vision. You cannot work by yourself. So the idea of having one director making all the decisions for one institution, it is not an updated model. And it is a method that has proved to be um, a failure. So I think that uh, uh, these institutions should be uh, managed by a group of people with different uh, um, capabilities and uh, knowledge. Um, it looks like um, we are getting there in Italy, but it doesn't look like uh, these things have been fully understood because of the experience. It can just come by. Uh, it, it, it looks like it's just a result of uh, minor changes within the cultural industry. So I think that you do not only need uh, a group of people, but a group of people that work in a participatory way. Now I'm going to leave the floor to Mikhail. I'm quite curious to know your opinion about it, how, how a creative mentality develops and how can we protect it from difficulties, boredom and repetition. I hope I understand everything, and I have to absolutely agree with you um, about what you said about kind of an, an open mindset that you that you need, and um, everybody um, everybody to participate in in the project or in the idea or in the innovation that should be that should be done. So when we are coming to an to a cultural institution, we are always we're coming there because there already is some kind of open mindset for that. But the first thing that we do is we make a kind of very small workshop with them where we just um, tell everybody to join together, like everybody from the director to, to the intern, and to create a game in a couple of minutes, like 15 minutes, create a game. And this kind of um, forces them to start communicating to each other in a different way, to listen to each other in a different way, and uh, uh, gives them the possibility to hear new ideas from within them, because uh, most of the time there are people from several professions um, who came into this, institutions, uh, in, in, into this institution and um, working for as maybe some, something um, completely different there. And when we, when we do this, it always it opens up their, their eyes and their ears and their minds, and suddenly ideas are flowing. So I think it is key to create some kind of spaces uh, where they can experiment and when you truly want to create something new, I think it is key to create a space where you are also able to fail in a way. Well, you said, of course, they have to do something that is, that is working in the end, you need a product, you need something to get out, but I think you have to start at a level where there's not that much pressure on in the beginning. So I think it is important to have some kind of starting point, some kind of really open starting point um, where you, where you um, um, begin your process with. And then I think you have the best chance, chances to find ideas that fit your organization in a way that it not only fix the, fit, fits the subject or the story that, you, uh, that your institution wants to, wants to tell, but also the people who work inside there and who are, um, yeah, you have to kind of enable them to create, create something new on their own and not only by external help. Can I say something about what she's just said? Sure. The importance of failure. I mean, this is a key topic. Um, it is not uh, something key only at the beginning. It is fundamental because it uh, is uh, an element of the cultural infrastructure I mentioned before, the capability to accept and embrace failure. This is an opportunity for learning, 
for learning something at a small scale with a small impact, with a little risk, but that has a huge impact on the further capability to create a meaningful um, uh, product. Yes, sure. And this is why before I insisted on the need to um, embrace prototypes. He used the word space. And I believe that if we want to make prototypes, we need spaces. In Italy, we have a few examples of these uh, spaces. They could be many more. Establishing these spaces uh, means that you uh, have uh, adequate spaces. However, the easier step is when you focus on the possibility of choosing a space, a room in which people may um, get together, brainstorm, make a mess, make prototypes, uh, make tests, uh, experiment. Uh, Trinale Milano perhaps it was one of these spaces and I think that uh, they have this kind of approach. So probably this is one of the the main elements uh, we uh, should consider as a take-home message from today. So we should try to put together different projects. We should have the possibility to fail and try again. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to leave the floor to Luisa Grasso. We're asking the same thing to you. How do we project an innovative mindset and how do we protect it? I start from a very different perspective, which is, first of all, the audience and the people that are coming. So I think you can be as perfect in doing a plan on paper from HR to directors to whatever about how it's going to work. But ultimately, each venue, each... So there's two different categories. You've got the museum, which services a particular audience in learning. So it's understanding, first of all, your audience, and then the financial resources to support that. So I think a lot of museums that are run by the state or the government of, are limited by the resources that they have financially. And I think that's always something that, so they have to be more creative. How are they going to get, and some museums have done it brilliantly and others have struggled because they've got less appealing content or whatever. And I think the other thing, which I think is really important is, is the space that you have and how the cost of that space then impacts on what you can put in that space. So I think there are two key factors for me. One is financial and one is um, the understanding the audience that you're trying to bring in. And then the people that put all that together have to come from worlds which understand their content. So if you're looking at the British Museum or if you're looking at the museum of the Egyptian Museum in Turin, they have a very specific demographic. They have a very specific um, target audience and everything that they do, they construct around it, as do the Van Gogh Museum. But then you've got other museums who are trying to get into immersive because they can't afford to host exhibitions. There is a lot of economics attached with all of this. And, and sometimes I think people spend too much money on advisors and not enough listening to their core audience, personally. Sorry, a bit controversial. Luisa, uh... Luisa, in the past, I witnessed a similar uh, debates in Italy. And I noticed that uh, different cultural experts uh, shared their uh, preoccupation about the fragmentation of the audience. They thought that such fragmentation, or better said, such separation of audiences may disperse the attention. These things may not be functional in order to reach certain types of audience. However, 
This is important from the point of view of uh, um, cultural heritage uh, uh, conservation. A few years back at uh, Fondazione Fiscarraldo, uh, they talked about refractory audiences. Refractory, uh, what do we do with refractory audiences? So, oh, what do we do with reluctant audiences? Because from the point of view of performances, it would be rational to insist on convincing uh, people to get to that museum. But from a social point of view, it wouldn't be uh, that negative. To the very heart of everything, which is why museums and galleries were set up. Education. They are a form of, edu they are educational. You know, when I was growing up in, 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 in England, we going to the theatre if you lived outside of London was a big thing in the 70s. So the theatre was brought to our school. And so we were then given performances by theatre companies who went round the schools and introduced us to theatres, right? In fact, one of the people in my school, she was older than me, was um, uh, a very famous actress who won loads of Oscars and she cre credited her, her success on the theatre groups that came and inspired her. Because, you know, there is an elitist problem that we have. So it has to start with education and bringing kids in. Um, I was involved in a very beautiful project many, many years ago. I was on the executive board of the Royal Academy of Arts in London. And one of the things that we said as a group was actually, how do we get kids to enjoy the museum? And we're talking 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And actually what we did was we created this, which is now everywhere, but was the idea of having a cushion. You had your cushion designed and you came in and you listened to music and you looked at the pictures and kids who came from really poor areas went into these and had an experience today those guys are digital success stories but and they participate in so i think education is really at the heart of all of this journey and that's also understanding how and what you are offering and i think that local governments um, and councils because there is a problem of money then it has to be down to how then you you work together and I'm working on a project in London. I've been advising a 1.4 billion regeneration project, urban. And so my, my role has been as cultural advisor. So you take money from the banks, you take money from the developers, and you have spaces which are then given specifically for artists, innovative art, and bringing people in at zero cost people who couldn't go into museums, but it comes into where there is a music venue, where there's a theater. So it's changing the discourse, right? Looking at different ways. I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think there is a lot in there. And, and so I, I kind of, I'm, I hope I'm on track, but. Uh, Louisa, it does. And I also would like to ask, to, to, to add that uh, uh, having an educational department, which is outstanding, uh, is at the core of some success stories in Italy, for example. I've been working in a museum in the north of Italy, the Mart, which uh, managed to get on a, on a um, to, to, to get a new venue, a very important uh, uh, public uh, contribution. And one of the reasons why it did was that, that the educational activities uh, score were really outstanding whereas the collections uh, were not so uh, incredible at the time. I'm talking about the, the, the late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, there, and therefore, this, what you are advocating is also uh, rational for uh, uh, growth, of, uh, the, the overall growth of the museum, including uh, having, having the money to, to find a better venue. Yeah, I also think, sorry to interject, I don't think it's just education of kids. I think it's education of parents and the economics of going into these spaces. So, because it's very expensive, it can be very expensive. I mean, one of the big things which is wonderful in London, for example, is the Victoria and Albert Museum is free, right? So if it's a rainy day, you can just walk in and 
as a parent, you know, you take your little children around and suddenly they are surrounded by beauty, right? So you, it's about, it goes to economics, education and encouraging diverse members of society to remove that thing that a museum is elitist. And I think that immersive artists in residence, workshops and all those things mm -hmm. help do that. Luisa, resta con noi se puoi o altre Luisa, please stay with us because I have other things to tell you. But first, I would like to leave the floor to Florinda. Just one second. Florinda, I have a question for you. Could you please tell us about your project in Sicily? And could you please tell us how to nourish an innovative mindset? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for this question and for this invitation. Before talking about innovative mindset, I would focus on innovation. Innovation is a combination of uh, different uh, failures that are systemized. In order to create innovation, we should know what we have in order to be able to transform it. We're facing a major uh, problem. It is that we have stopped thinking. We resort on other people's thinking, and we've lost the uh, capability to uh, um, critical thinking. So we, um, we follow other people. 28% of the population among 16 and 65 years of age in Italy is uh, uh, functionally illiterate, but they use social networks and they can talk to uh, everybody and they nourish the culture of ignorance instead of nourishing the culture of innovation. Therefore, I think that we should um, give ourselves the possibility to fail but the failure must be an opportunity to make the most of our mistakes. We should also research and make experiments, and throughout it we can create new things. More than preserving an innovative mindset, I would focus and I will talk about a transformative mindset. We're experiencing an extremely fast uh, age and institutions must uh, keep up with the space. We cannot do it if we do not uh, have a multidisciplinary approach, an intergenerational approach and most of all, a systemic approach. Could you please be more specific when talking about your project, uh, especially in the light of the, um, uh, of, uh, um, the possibility to make failures, uh, making the most of failures, uh, and uh, embracing different generations? We are lucky enough to have a place that allows us to do so. And it is also a place that becomes a point of reference for those who are there. We uh, were born as a center of contemporary art. And over the years, we understood that contemporary art could not um, be art for art, contemporary art for art's sake. Uh, art and creativity today for us are tools uh, that serve our community. That is why we uh, created uh, uh, Kanjin cities uh, where we host different cities uh, to understand how our contacts and communities can approach a uh, sustainable and green development. Also this year we will host a quadriennial that is called Radical She. Uh, and we shift focus uh, on equality, gender. Uh, so we move from the general notions uh, to the 
specific notions. So we also perform a test and we ask people to fill in a form. And then there are educational activities. We work with children, with the School of Architecture, and with the girls, with women, and with uh, a School of Politics for young women. And also we involve dance too, we, and literature too. So we have a transdisciplinary approach. We uh, worked on prevention, uh, doing prevention and medicine through culture, and we turned a venue that into a forest, and, but that was an ancient building, and so we created a relationship between the human being and nature, and uh, exploiting research that focus on the benefits of nature on the human being. This is what we do. Ours is a field of experimentation. There is no magical solution to find innovation. But if we do not let ourselves experiment and do things that are not necessarily part of a structured system, uh, we, if we do not do that, we cannot break that barrier that makes us then um, become innovative and different. When you talk about innovation, I'm sure that you also speak about behaviors that are mediated probably. But uh, yes, when talking about prevention uh, in relation to health care, with the Centre of Turin, we developed a pathway of inclusive dance for people and also for, peop for, for the wider audience, but also for people suffering from a Parkinson. At the same time, uh, the day before yesterday, we concluded a workshop on addiction, but not addiction uh, from substances. Uh, and we organized creative laboratories. We're doing the same thing with foreigners uh, that live in Sicily and that then often uh, praise uh, uh, to the organized crime. So we are fostering inclusion through art and creativity. We try to shed light on the various uh, uh, professions and professionals uh, that work around creativity. Thank you very much. After this first round, I would like to say that the audience can also ask questions, but they're not there in the room with you, so I cannot see whether there are uh, people in the room who want to ask questions. Uh, surely this is a moment uh, when the, the audience can ask questions, maybe somebody's curious about something, and you can ask questions and we can answer. Otherwise, I will ask something else to Marcia. It is something that I have been thinking uh, of since you spoke about the uh, processes and not only products. Italy is also the country of the small museums, uh, public museums that lack resources, lack means, uh, and where many things have to be improved. So, what is what are the guidelines of innovation? The basic guidelines of innovation for those who do not that do not have a real product because they cannot afford it, so they cannot even hold contemporary uh, exhibitions. But they have a collection, maybe of ancient art or of design or of popular traditions, uh, and might want to understand this blurred world and start become, start being more innovative based on some basic principles. So yes, I'm asking you, I'm asking for your advice, basically. What can they do? In Italy, we are particularly unlucky because in Italy, in particular, we do not have enough money. We have great constraints. Yes, there, are, there, there, there is never money. Yes, but for example, let's, I mean, I don't think that Rotterdam has so much money. Maybe they have 
a little bit more on money, but also there's the Victoria and Albert Museum that does not have a huge budget. I've worked with them. So it is a common problem. We pursued a small project with Kunsthal, that is the Museum of Contemporary Art in, uh, the, in Rotterdam. So it is a quite well-known, quite renowned museum in Europe. So we've done small things that had a great impact. Innovation does not have to be a $2 billion project, but we could just devote some time uh, to it and try and understand the audience. Uh, she said, she said that she said something controversial, but actually it is not controversial. I just think it is complex, because if you want to get out and really try to understand the audience that I want to reach, who are those people? Where are they? Why aren't they coming? We should try to understand the real needs. And in order to do that, you need the right skills. But going back to what I was saying regarding the training, that is, we can do something very simple. We could organize a day with the frontline staff, and we could teach them uh, something so that they can have a minim meaningful conversation for the people that get in the museum for the first time, maybe, in order to understand the latent needs and how they can be met within the limits of the museum means and resources. For example, at the Kunsthalle, there was one small thing that we did. We created a rest area with just a couple of two stools uh, that they had in the warehouse. Uh, and we put them along a path, a cultural path that was very long, and almost nobody could finish it because it was very long. So people sat down, the frontline staff understood the people needed rest areas that could help people have a rest and sit down and look at a particular uh, work of art. So these are tiny things that cost nothing with existing resources, but that brought about a huge change in the experience of that specific audience. I can make cut this examples like that. We supported another entity. Uh, we improved the way finding because it was a hard to find something. Uh, it was hard to understand where these places were. So we improved the way found the way finding uh, through a we just use a printer to do so. We just use a paper. So this is what I'm trying to say. We need to engage, you know, engage in the audience and engage in the staff that really perceives the reality and really do the things. Uh, shows that innovation does not have to be huge, expensive, or disruptive. It can just, it can also uh, develop inch by inch. I would like to add something in relation to what you've just said. I was struck by one zero-cost project from, it was incredible from the point of view of physical production. Uh, I'm thinking about the cards that define keywords that then help understand the rest of the texts in the room. And I saw these at the Tate Modern. These are simple tickets uh, with the definition of collection of curator. Those are terms that are enabling, uh, that help people understand what they're going to read later. If you decide to produce it, it means that you have become aware of the fact that your language is a, sector, is, is a jargon um, of your sector. So they understood a collection is a term that should be explained. I do not know how you say it in German, Michael, but collection means many, collezione, that is collection. In Italy, it means many things. And collezione and the collection is just one of the um, meanings of this term. Then I'm thinking about another example. Uh, I'm thinking about the rest area at the National Gallery in Rome that really made a difference. Maybe not only it is beautiful, 
but it is also very well designed. So these are beautiful examples. They do exist. Mikhail, let us now go back to the issue of games, if you wish. Are games a good thing? Uh, of course, games are a very, very good thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of, I, I don't have to tell you, there are a lot of like psychological and social upsides of playing games. Um, and you can read a lot of books um, with that. I'm not a scientist, I make games, and I found out that, that gaming is great to accessing, accessing stories. And um, what I find interesting that you asked this question right here because it kind of implies that there should be, there is something like a general fear of, um, of games that they could do harm to a narrative or to a, to a story. So what I think is really, really important is that you, um, or where, where I think innovation starts and why I think games are so good is that you have to take your narrative and um, start finding new perspectives perspectives um, perspectives on that like opening up your your stories question the ownership of of uh, stories that you're telling in your um, in your institution and um, and find ways of letting people inside letting them interact with it opening up the space and so i think um, making games is a really really hard process so not all the games are good, but gaming itself and playing is a really good thing that has a lot of opportunities and high upsides to um, to institutions' narratives. Uh, Michael, Michael, uh, you said challenging. You, you, you said, I'm waiting for you to wear your earphones. Uh, you've just said challenging the uh, copyrights of objects that are acquired. And you made me think about a beautiful project of Reich Museum in Amsterdam, in which a person from a specific audience uh, that was clearly found with great effort, Marzia, that he was a boy from Suriname. Anyway, he came from an area of the world that um, the Netherlands had colonized in the past. This person uh, was asked to use an app, a web app that, in, that had some videos. Uh, those are the web apps that do not need to be downloaded. This person was asked to express his opinion on a painting where that depicted a famous uh, Dutch colonizer uh, that uh, colonized the world. So the famous decolonization of uh, the sites, the cases, but was really well done in a pop manner uh, by challenging one's own right to speak about a work of art from only one perspective. Uh, so this beautiful thing was done very simply. This boy, this uh, young, young man, was just asked to comment on this painting. So now, uh, I would like to ask you something else about games, uh, Mikhail. Is does technology matters in Italy with uh, with uh, pursued very beautiful projects uh, that are technological and are concerned games in Naples, for example. I've noticed that the technological effort in designing and distributing games might have been better, might have been more effective. Do, how much technology do we need for games? Where do they need to be distributed? Rina Sofia developed a game for the PlayStation, if I am not wrong. So, is this the way forward, or should we instead focus on more independent distribution? Sorry, I have asked many questions in only one question. question. So, first of all, I think there's a uh, there's a mix-up between technology and innovation. I think uh, innovation does not start with um, with technology. 
often I, I hear museums say, we, we need something new, let's make something with virtual reality or something with augmented reality. But that's not the case because they just reproduce their, as I told you before, they, they kind of reproduce the stories they, that they already have. But I think innovation starts with the story itself and uh, then finding ways to enforce this, this story, this new approach on the, on the subject that you're, that you're telling. So I think the story comes very first, like the, the most important technology that, that, that we have is storytelling and all technology comes second. And every technology itself has a narrative. When I, when I look at a door, I, I see a door handle and the door handle tells me, use the door handle to open the door. And I think also these other much more complex technologies also have these narratives, but so oftentimes they don't fit uh, with the stories that we would like to tell. Mm -hmm. So they say, make a game about this subject and use VR. And both have nothing to do with each other. So I think you have to find a clear story, a clear narrative, and then define what's the kind of technology that I want to use. And this technology can also be a card game, it can be a board game, it can be an event, it can be, it can be something that is completely separated to high budget technology. And yes, distribution could be better everywhere. In Germany, we have the same problem. <laughs> I would like to now ask some questions to Luisa, but I would like to say something now because then I might forget. Just something quite light hearted. Michael, what is written on your t shirt? I think something in Italian, maybe, but you have to tell me. <laughs> I think Amore Vabbè, is somewhere on this. Grazie, Michel. Allora, Thank you, Michael. Now let's be serious again. Let's be serious again now. Uh, I noted down some things that I would like to ask to Luisa because we all work for events, we produce also music, because you, you produced also uh, high level events like music events. What is the way forward for those who can design events, even in a small place, such as an auditorium, a small auditorium? So how can we understand what is the right audience and what are the right artists? and even uh, compete on the market. Um, uh, what kind of advice would you give to an institution that might want to start designing events or might want to improve the designing of events? There's three things I think are really important. And, and creating an event has changed greatly because what has happened is, and this is where I absolutely agree with Mikhail, there's two different things. There's innovation and then there's technology, right? So technology is a great support to marketing, to promoting, to all of those things. But at the heart of it is creating an event which is creative, right? That allows people to feel that they're experiencing something new. and. The reality is it doesn't always have to be um, expensive, but it has to be cohesive and it has to be truthful to what you're representing, right? So I remember many, 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 many years ago, there were a lot of really, we did this, we had this idea about putting acoustic singers in a museum, right? Because actually what it did was it brought in the audience of the acoustic singer in the context of a beautiful space. And in fact, on Monday evening, I was, at, I don't know if anybody know how much people know London, but the Wallace Collection is a private museum in central London, which was gifted to the city by the Wallace family in the 18th century. And they had a beautiful evening where they had the English Royal Ballet School had the ballet, the dancers performing within the space. And it was open to people who wanted to have the, the experience of dance and art together outside of the normal hours. And it wasn't elitist, it wasn't, it was, it was really beautiful. So I think if I'm putting my promoter's hat on, it's about truth of what your venue is and what you are proposing 
and then being innovative, but then using technology to reach an audience to come. Because when I used to promote, we used to put big posters up on the, on the walls. You can't do that anymore, right? That's changed. So I think it's about how you then reach your audience. And I think technology is very helpful with that. Sorry, you've muted. I had muted my microphone, that's true. When you talk about, when you say this, do you mean that we should also be able to say no to events that might be available because they because they are quite attractive in terms of budget. They're quite easy in terms of budget, but, but, but that not, might not be truthful to the place. And I think it's about knowing your audience, right? How you, how you present yourself. Um, you can be really, I remember many, many years ago in Naples, actually, we proposed doing a really cool punk exhibition right which punk was completely in a in a church which was um you know which was no longer a, a practicing church and it was attached to the museum i think it was museo madre i think in naples it was one of the and the, anyway and that was completely out of you know god a punk museum exhibition in 2005 in a in a museum that had contemporary installations in a church which no longer existed Unfortunately, there was a bolt of lightning and the roof collapsed. So I think it was maybe going against the, but it, you could put that in there. So it doesn't always have to be conventional, but I think you have to understand how that then adds value. If you do it just for the shock purpose, I don't think that's a good idea, but I think you, if you do it in an innovative way and you expand your audience, which is I think why immersive art has been very useful. Now everybody's doing immersive art, right? It's become very throwaway. But when it started, it attracted a new audience who were experiencing art in a different way than they had before, not just looking at it. So I think it really is back to how creative you can be. And I think the team behind it and the staff and the, the organizers need to work with people who know and have that experience. So bringing that experience in where you don't have it. Luisa, a proposito di chi è... Luisa, you were talking about churches and there is one interesting characteristic regarding the Italian audiences. Very often there are places where we have religious tourism uh, literally next to other places. For example, in Padua we have the Botanic Garden that is the oldest in the world that is just next to the Cathedral of St. Anthony. But these two audiences ignore each other for clear reasons. Uh, I know that this applies to the church, but clearly the kind of audience of the Botanic Garden should be included as a new kind of audience that is not reluctant. Um, drive traffic through. How do you drive the traffic? And that's where it's understanding how to bring your audience into a different space which supports what you're doing. And I think... So I will ask this question to Marzia then. But first, maybe Marzia, you wanted to comment on what had been said previously. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'd like to get back on 40 points uh, you've mentioned. So my question is, how do we create a pathway that brings a new audience to an existing place? Well. Knowing your audience is a pillar of our activity. Sometimes uh, the approach is an inside-out approach to the problem. What I think is what the audience want me as uh, the curator, as the director. So it is important to reach people the way they are by creating participatory processes that um, um, support inclusion. Luisa before mentioned the Victorian Albert Museum, which is free. Well, great. 
However, Victoria and Albert Museum is in South Kensington, so I'm wondering how many people from the outskirts of London go to uh, South Kensington. So one of the um, smartest things that the Victorian and Albert Museum uh, has been doing uh, is that they are uh, going to the places uh, where their new audiences are. In fact, uh, they have planned on opening in Hackney, on Smithfield. Boymans is thinking about uh, opening a new branch in Rotterdam South. These are um, um, less privileged uh, neighborhood of these um, cities. And therefore, uh, these museums are creating processes of co-participation going where the new audiences are located, bringing to street level um, what they want to communicate. They are setting, uh, living apart the so-called lofting culture and they are creating uh, uh, scenarios at street level. Uh, Victorian Albert Museum Victor of London. Ed è iniziato proprio per Victorian Albert Museum. Um, uh, scusa. Uh, prefer English, but on this point, perché per. Well, sorry, I'm mixing up the two languages. Well. And so, questo è anche regeneration of urban areas, che riporta anche a questo che è molto importante. So we should get back to it. 20 anni fa, there's no way on earth that uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum that it's become today would have opened. They had in Bethnal Green the Children's Museum and five people used to go. So regeneration, urbanization, planning, government, the, there's so many different components that come into play that make it so it's not just one thing. And I think that's where the, um, you have to divide institutional government investment to private support because they're two different bodies. But I agree, it's, 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 there's so many elements to this. Sorry to interject, sorry to interrupt. No, mi, mi permetto di segnalare un, un bel progetto che va in... There's a project uh, going towards this direction. It is taking place in uh, Bolzano where the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art is being designed. It is located in a uh, central and very German area of the city. However, this museum opened um, opened uh, a space in um, uh, in the peripheral uh, in one, in an area located in the outskirts of Bolzano. It is a, it is a poor area, mainly Italian. It is very interesting, and the, this idea was uh, included within the original uh, plan of the museum. And the fact that this is um, located in, um, in a poor area of the city uh, is similar to what you are, um, the cases you're mentioning. Before we uh, leave the floor to Floriana, uh, I'd like to know what you wanted to tell us about uh, before, Floriana. Yes, there are other things. I should get back to my notes. There is something I'd like to highlight about the audiences. Quite often, we uh, think about museums as cultural institutions uh, that should attract the public. However, the fact that the museum is moving to the outskirts is not only related to bringing that the, near the inhabitants of that house court inside the museum, the uh, social mission of that house court is bringing the audience of that original museum to an area they would have never visited. So it is um, the inversion of a trend, it's not only about the development of the museum, it is about understanding how uh, museums may become urban propellers for uh, poor areas. This is extremely interesting, and uh, I'd like you to make proposals uh, from this point of view. Has it ever happened to you something like that in Sicily? 
or in other areas of Italy. Have you ever noticed that there are areas, urban areas, that could have been quite um, appropriate for these types of initiatives? Of course, if in Abu Dhabi they wanted the Louvre with all the problems that it entailed, there should be a reason. However, I think that the role of the institutions must be a double one. The professionals of culture are quite arrogant and their language is not easy to understand for everybody. So what we said before about participation, which is full of rhetoric and uh, the involvement of people, I think there's still a lot of um, things to do. Uh, however, when it comes to cultural travelers or um, museum audiences, I mean, uh, Within this, within, I mean, the renowned uh, uh, cultural institutions uh, could um, make a cultural planning that could include the old territory. Favara had zero visitors. It had uh, uh, six uh, hotel rooms, while now we have 600 hotel rooms. And before uh, the pandemic, we had 60,000 paying visitors to Favara. So institutions should uh, uh, not only uh, chase the public, they should also think about the meaning of a cultural institution within a certain territory. If we do it, um, we should not uh, restrain ourselves to um, uh, organizing a good concert, organizing a good exhibition. We have to think about the kind of cultural development we want to bring to that territory. Uh, about going to uh, difficult places, I would like to say something. In Italy, there's a conceptual problem, which could be also a lexical one. In international literature, outreach is a very common word. We do not have a direct translation for the word outreach. And when a word is lacking in one language, uh, it means that the concept is missing in that specific language and culture. Um, I think it's about time to wrap up this session, unless Marcia wants to add up something. Yes, uh, I was thinking about uh, the colonization. Uh, there's uh, an initiative of the Museum of London. I wrote about it a few days ago, where basically they went around the town and they collected all the statues that were thrown down during Black Lives Matter, during the demonstration of Black Lives Matter. So they um, collected them and they are organizing a collab-like uh, um, community in order to decide what to do with those statues. Their meanings are, of course, controversial, but they do have uh, an artistic value. And this is a beautiful example of how uh, the Museum of London is involving the community in uh, taking decisions in, uh, about what, to, what they're going to do with an object of art. And they've and the, he's left. Where is he? Are we going to self-moderate this session? Uh, it's still that issue with uh, uh, my microphone. Uh, yes, I, I was about to um, wrap up this session. However, before I would like to ask you something about the new definition of a museum by ICOM. ICOM. Um, I've noticed that the new definition where well, he's gone. Okay. Thank you very much to the, all of you um, for having been here with us. I don't think he's going to come back. Um, hello. I'm back. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if you can hear us, if you, if you can hear me. I think I'm having some troubles with my internet connection. 
well, uh, since I'm not sure about my internet connection, I think it's better if we uh, if we conclude this session. Thank you very much for your participation.